Hello friends, I'm Ruth Milkman. I teach here at the CUNY Graduate Center as well as at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and I'm happy to be part of this workshop. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, inequality as it relates to the U.S. labor movement. Um, I'll start with a little bit about the history of unionization trends in the United States and then zero in a little bit on the causes and consequences of union decline since the mid-1970s. I'll say a little bit also about why union decline matters and how it is related to growing inequality. And finally, um, I'll say something about the current state of the U.S. labor movement and its future prospects. Um, I want to start with a slide that shows something you probably are well aware of already, which is the steep decline in unionization rates since the early 1980s. It's basically a steady decline with a few bumps along the way. Um, and of course, this is something um, many of us have been um, very concerned about reversing. Um, it's an alarming situation in many ways, and yet if we take the long historical view, it's certainly not unprecedented. In the early part of the 20th century, unionization rates were similar to what they are right now. Um, the current rate in the private sector for the last year that we have data for, that is 2019, was 6.2%, meaning that 94% of U.S. private sector workers were not union members. Um, that level is not unprecedented. Again, in 1900, um, overall union density was about 6.8%, and that was all in the private sector. The public sector had not um, yet expanded to its current size and was completely non-union. Um, fast forwarding slightly to 1930, the period before the rise of industrial unionism and the New Deal, which is often seen as the kind of prehistory of the modern U.S. labor movement. In 1930, overall union density was about 13 percent. Today, overall union density, that is both public and private sector, is 10.3 percent as of 2019. Um, and when you um, take into account that the public sector was still relatively small and mostly non-union in 1930, that's quite similar to now. So we've basically gone back in many ways, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, to conditions that were typical of the pre-New Deal era um, in regard to the labor movement and many other things, including the rates of inequality itself. Um, in the United States, unionization reached its peak in the mid-1950s. At that point, both in the um, overall and in the private sector, density was about 35 percent, um, something roughly six times more than it is now. Um, the erosion began in the late 1950s, quite a long time ago, but it really took off in the late 70s and especially after 1980. Um, the next slide shows you the decline of private sector unionism, in particular in contrast to public sector unionism, which has been relatively stable. It has actually declined slightly in the last few years, but um, compared to the private sector situation, it's quite a healthy rate. Um, that may change in the future for reasons I'll get into later. Okay, and the next slide gives you a kind of graphic representation of what I was just talking about, the kind of longer view where you can see that um, prior to the uh, late 1930s, um, unionization levels were similar to today. Um, 1935 is the kind of banner year here. That's when the Wagner Act, officially called the National Labor Relations Act, often referred to as Labor's Magna Carta, was signed into law um, under FDR. Um, and unionization spikes upward shortly afterward, and especially during the Second World War, um, for reasons I don't have time to tell you about, but that's the real um, dramatic story of union rise after 1935. Okay, so deunionization is clearly um, a trend that is of concern right now and pretty much tracks the growth in inequality. Um, unions not only have fewer members, but also their leverage has declined quite dramatically in recent years, in recent decades. Um, strikes, the one weapon that organized labor has um, that is most disruptive and most effective in extracting concessions from employers have declined dramatically um, in frequency from about 289 a year in the 1970s to 35 a year in the 1990s. 
and only 15 a year in the 2000s. Um, so that's, you know, a very telling indicator of what's going on. There was a small increase in strikes in 2018 and 19, but it doesn't take us anywhere close to the level of strike activity in the 1970s and before. Um, not only that, but some of the strikes that take place in the 21st century, that took place in the 21st century, are not are defensive struggles provoked deliberately by employers as opposed to union-led offensive actions. So the numbers are, you know, exaggerate even the few strikes that have occurred. Um, the strikes in 2018, mostly teacher strikes, are in the public sector, which is very different from private sector strikes, which have declined the most dramatically. Um, another thing that's reminiscent of the period before 1935 is the rebirth of short, often one day or even shorter, um, so-called demonstration strikes. Those are becoming more common um, since long-term strikes are very risky for workers nowadays. Here you see a graph that um, shows the dramatic decline I described, and you can also see the spikes in strike activity during, um, well, immediately after World War II and in the 1960s, but if you fast, if you look at the right-hand part of the graph, you can see the sharp, sharp decline in strike activity. Um, there are other indicators of unions' reduced power. Um, in some industries, for example, the auto industry or another one that's been in the news a lot of late, meatpacking, unions are still present, but their influence within the industry has been dramatically reduced since the 1970s. Um, in the heyday of unionism, in the immediate post-World War II period, something called pattern bargaining, which meant that if one firm agreed to a certain kind of union contract, others in the same industry would sort of imitate that. That was very common. That has completely disappeared. Um, economists like to talk about unions as something that can, quote, take wages out of competition, meaning that in a given industry, um, while firms might compete with one another, they don't do so anymore on the basis of squeezing labor, but rather on the basis of um, quality or productivity or something like that. Um, union, uh, wages are now part of the competition in a way that they were not in the mid-20th century. Um, another thing that's changed is that right-to-work laws, which are not what they sound like, those are laws that um, prohibit union shops. Union shops are workplaces where um, workers are uh, represented by the union more or less automatically under the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. They can escape if they choose to, but the default is that they're union members. Um, those are illegal in right-to-work um, states. And those um, states are now a majority of the states in the country. There are 26 right-to-work states, up from 20 as recently as 1975. And what's really remarkable is that um, legendary union strongholds like Michigan and Wisconsin are now right-to-work states. You can see that as well in the slide. There's another thing I just want to highlight, which is that many people assume that um, union decline is related to deindustrialization, and it is related, but the decline in unionism is by no means limited to manufacturing. Um, in construction, for example, which obviously can't be outsourced, at least not yet, um, the decline was almost as sharp. So um, the slide shows figures from 1973 to 2018, and you can see that um, in construction, um, the dramatic decline in unionism only slightly less severe than in manufacturing. And indeed, in the private sector as a whole, density fell sharply from a lower level than in manufacturing to begin with, but to a lower level um, today. So. Uh, it's, it's not just a story of globalization or um, outsourcing the, the flight of capital from the U.S. to other countries in service sector jobs, in construction, and other things that can't go anywhere. We've seen similar levels of decline. So why has this happened? Um, there are several reasons, as you might expect, but the single most important one is an employer-led assault on private sector unions. Um, at some point in the neoliberal turn period of the 1970s, employers began aggressively um, uh, engaging in efforts to destroy or weaken unions where they existed and to prevent their emergence in non-union workplaces. 
Um, that became a whole industry, sometimes called the union avoidance industry, um, more colloquially in my world known as union busting. Um, and so there are legions of lawyers who specialize in this and who firms hire at the first hint that a union um, organizing campaign might be afoot in their workplace. Another thing that's changed, this is something that was legal a long time ago, but rarely done um, until the late 1970s and early 1980s, which is that under the National Labor Relations Act, employers do have the right in economic strikes to hire so-called permanent re replacements for strikers, which means that once the strike is settled, the people who went out on strike have no right to return to the job. And so that has made strikes extremely risky and helps account for that dramatic decline in strikes that um, I showed you before. So outsourcing is also a factor here. Obviously, if you um, close down a union steel plant and start making the, you know, importing the steel from Brazil or Korea or whatever, that obviously um, leads to union decline as well. But, but at least as important is domestic subcontracting. Um, a university, for example, might choose to hire a subcontractor to provide food services for its students and faculty, um, often replacing work that was done by direct employees of the university in the past. And often that means um, a shift from a union to a non-union um, workforce. So, and that's just one example. That's been a growing trend all through the economy as firms um, have decided that it's in their interest to concentrate on their so-called core competencies. They outsource everything outside those core competencies and often to the lowest bidder, which tends to be a non-union entity. Um, there are other factors that contr have contributed, um, include deregulation, which is not often discussed in this context, but should be. Um, think about the deregulation of trucking, for example, which pretty much overnight transformed what had once been a highly unionized industry with good paying jobs, with pensions and health care and all the rest, um, in which the Teamsters Union was a major force. Um, the union with deregulation in 1980 um, was dramatically undermined and uh, many trucking operations shifted to owner operators that's the extreme form of subcontracting, of course, to an individual as opposed to a firm. Um, and uh, there's an example where deregulation really mattered. Um, another factor, of course, is the limited extent of new union organizing. There have been spurts of that here and there in the period since the mid-1970s, but unions have really been on the defensive and have not put... Um, extensive resources into that. The exception is the late 1990s when um, John Sweeney was elected president of the AFL-CIO in 1995 and ran on a program of organizing the unorganized and um, encouraged the unions affiliated with the AFL-CIO to do that. A few of them did, and there was an uptick in organizing and actually a flattening out of the, um, of the decline in density, in union density um, as a result, but that was very short-lived. Um, and now we're seeing um, a new wave of attacks on collective bargaining, this time uh, focused on the public sector. Unionism's already pretty much been eliminated from the private sector, so anti-union forces, including the Koch brothers and others, um, have turned their attention to public sector unionism, and they've been um, quite successful on the legal front there. Density has not declined that much yet, but it might. Um, there's a slide showing the um, toolkit that right-wing groups have developed to attack workers. Um, I don't really have time to get into this, but if you do a little um, search for Union Decline and ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, you will find extensive evidence of this situation. Um, public sector density remains quite high, despite all this um, thus far. It's about five times the level in the private sector. Um, and we have seen a burst of um, recent activity in the public sector among teachers in particular. Teachers are one of the most, um, one of the most largest sorry, one of the largest occupational groups um, in the labor movement. 16% of all U.S. union members today are teachers. Um, so why should we care about this, especially you guys who are interested in growing inequality? I, I um, would 
just point out that unionism is very closely tied to levels of inequality or equality. Um, there, there are two pieces of scholarship that you might want to take a look at, one by Bruce Western and Jake Rosenfeld, which analyzes the growth in inequality and um, shows that about 20% of it among women, 20% of the growth in inequality from the mid-1970s to the 2007 was um, due to declining unionization, and among men, an even higher rate of 33%. That's pretty dramatic. Um, another study that I recommend you take a look at if you're interested in this um, by Henry Brady and some of his colleagues um, talks about the effect of um, unions on reducing poverty and shows that the effect of unionism is greater than that of um, both economic performance and social policy for both union members or sorry households that have union members in them and those that don't so that's another dramatic indicator of what's going on so this really does matter um, in ways that not everybody fully appreciates um, you've probably seen this next slide before it shows that labor compensation um, used to be tied to productivity in the United States until the same time everything else changes, the mid-1970s. And then you see a breakaway where compensation is flat and productivity continues to rise. Um, so that's another um, key part of the story here. In and, and that widening of the divide, it's not just a coincidence that it happens at the same time that union decline begins. Um, I want to say a little bit in the time I have left, about the um, issue, a sort of intersectional approach to this topic, looking at the ways in which um, the impact of union decline has um, differentially affected different demographic groups. So one thing that's really changed is that whereas in the New Deal era, it was non-college educated workers, blue collar workers especially, who benefited most from unionism and were disproportionately unionized, um, today, that has really changed. College-educated workers are actually more likely um, to be union members than non-college-educated workers, and that's mostly related to the growth of public sector unionism. And again, I already mentioned teachers as being a big chunk of that, but um, other college-educated workers also are um, very numerous in the public sector. Think of nurses and other college-educated healthcare workers, social workers, um, many um, administrative employees of um, federal, state, and local government. So there's been a big shift in that regard. Of course, over this period of time, the entire population is more likely to go to college, but um, the shift in among union members is even sharper. Um, in terms of race, we also see some pretty dramatic um, transformations over time. African Americans were very um, few among union members prior to World War II, but as they entered War in so-called war industries, the industries that grew so dramatically in manufacturing during the Second World War. They also became union members in large numbers during that time. And there was another surge in African-American organizing um, during and after the civil rights movement. But as manufacturing began to fall apart starting in the late 1970s, um, by that time it had become a heavily African-American sector of the economy. Um, that meant African-Americans lost ground. However, around the same time that that happened, um, the growth of public sector unionism really took off in the 1960s and 70s. And because African Americans are disproportionately employed in the public sector, they did benefit from that. Although now those gains are um, under threat. You can see um, in this chart the disproportionate effect on um, workers of color and especially African Americans of union decline since the 70s. And um, the story in terms of gender is slightly different. Well, quite different, actually. Um, women also are highly overrepresented in public sector employment. Teachers, nurses, social workers, the groups I already mentioned, are overwhelmingly female. Um, so what's happened is, as union membership has declined, it's become more heavily female. There's an old article about um, women in the professions that I often mentioned in this context, which I'll share with you the title. Um, it's by uh, uh, Carter and Carter, and it's called Women Get a Ticket to Ride After the Gravy Train Has Left the Station. And that does apply to women in the professions. Um, for example, if you think about uh, the medical profession, its uh, upward trajectory pretty much flattens out right when 
uh, large numbers of women become physicians. Same thing with law and academia. Um, but it's also true of union membership. Um, some other demographic points that might interest you. One is the age um, gradient in union membership. As you can see from the slide, younger members are the least, sorry, younger workers are the least likely to be unionized of any workers. That may be changing now for reasons I'll tell you about, but um, it's been true for a long time, partly because people are less likely to quit or um, to quit or be fired from unionized jobs. It's harder to fire a unionized worker. The collective bargaining agreement gives you some protection against that. And also, these jobs tend to be better paid and um, more desirable in other ways than non-union jobs, so people are less likely to exit voluntarily. And that means um, as you get older, you stay in the job. So um, we see much more um, unionization among those older workers. Um, another topic of interest is immigrant unionization. It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, there used to be a big gap between um, foreign-born and U.S.-born unionization rates, but it's almost closed, as you can see from the slide. Um, and if you limit your analysis to immigrants who've been in the United States so long, for a long time, for more than a couple of decades, their rate actually is higher than that of the average U.S.-born worker. Um, we also know from surveys that immigrants are more interested in becoming union members than native foreign workers. So um, those other are some of the demographic dimensions of the story. So now I want to turn in the little time I have left to talk about what's going on now and um, some of the efforts to revitalize the labor movement and some of it, the things that might um, be coming in the future years. So first, um, there's a phrase that's become popular in recent times called alt labor organizations. It means, you know, as in the alt right, we have alt labor. And what that refers to is organizations that represent workers or uh, or um, advocate for them, but are not unions. They are often called worker centers and um, other nonprofit organizations, community based organizations of various kinds. There's about 200, um, slightly over 200 worker centers in the US today, up from virtually nothing in, the, say, 1980. Um, they tend to be clustered in low wage labor markets, day laborers, domestic workers. Um, and in sectors that unions have um, abandoned or neglected, like re the restaurant industry, for example. Um, you may have heard of the Restaurant Opportunities Center. That's a worker center. Um, the Taxi Workers Alliance here in New York is another example. Um, those are uh, Taxi workers are considered independent contractors these days. And so that's what they have organized. So they can't be in a um, conventional labor union, but they can organize and they have done. Um, some organize along ethnic lines. Um, one here in New York that's one of the oldest worker centers um, in the United States is called Chinese Staff and Workers, um, and there are some others. These groups mostly focus on issues of um, employment law violations, like people being paid less than the minimum wage, not being paid properly for overtime, um, problems that have grown up especially in the low-wage labor market in this period of union decline, um, and they've become, they've grown in number and um, been very effective at sort of naming and shaming um, employers that violate the law. Um, many of them also are involved in the immigrant rights movement. Um, if you think about uh, Make the Road New York is one of the biggest worker centers in the country, actually, and in New York. Um, I want to also mention a union campaign that um, is very unconventional, in some ways more like alt-labor than like um, conventional unions, and that's the Fight for 15. You may have heard of this. It um, began shortly after the 2011 Occupy Wall Street movement as kind of an offshoot of that. The first Fight for 15 was a strike here in New York in 2012 among fast food workers, and then it became a national campaign funded by the Service Employees International Union. That campaign has the demand of $15 an hour and a union for fast food workers. They have not made any headway on the union front for reasons I don't have time to discuss, but they have um, won $15 an hour in many jurisdictions. Um, and a few large employers have, in response to the campaign, increased their wages to $15 an hour as well. So although this was a union-sponsored um, campaign, its tactics and approach are similar to those of alt labor, especially naming and shaming. Um, and you can see in the slide that um, quite a large number of um, workers have received 
raises as a result of the success of this campaign. And, um, this is just some examples from around the country. Um, they're quite substantial. Um, alongside this, this kind of thing, the, the growth of campaigns for increases in the minimum wage, we've seen um, other efforts to win um, legislation to improve the situation of workers. As unions have declined, this approach has come to the fore. Um, examples would include paid family leave and paid sick leave campaigns, which are quite um, widespread. It's not been possible for reasons you're aware of in, the, in recent years to do this at the federal level, but many states and localities have um, enacted legislation along these lines. There are also domestic workers' bill of rights. The first one was here in New York, and now there are eight states that have those, and also wage theft um, laws in various jurisdictions. Um, wage theft was always illegal, but these laws um, enhance the teeth in the law um, with more substantial penalties than the uh, federal legislation provides. Um, okay, I'm almost out of time, but I just want to say a little bit about something some of you maybe have been involved in, which is the growth of um, un interest in unionism and organizing among young millennial a generation and you know, roughly millennial generation, a little bit older and younger as well, um, especially among the college educated. And so we've seen, this is one of the few areas of recent growth in organized labor. Um, some of you may have been involved in organizing among adjunct faculty and or graduate teaching assistants. That's, those have been two growth areas. More recently, journalists, both online journalists and sometimes in conventional newsrooms like the LA Times, which historically was legendary for its anti-union stance. Um, less well known is the fact that the wave of teacher strikes in 2018 were led by millennials. The workers were very diverse in age, but the organizers were mostly millennials. Um, and then not in unions, but in what you might call another kind of alt labor, young workers have been organizing at Google and various other tech companies. Um, most recently in the face of the pandemic, um, it's been reported extensively that former supporters of Bernie Sanders, overwhelmingly young people, are now um, very actively involved in organizing labor protests among essential workers, for example, at Amazon warehouses and grocery stores. Um, finally, um, unions have, uh, have won extensive and growing public approval, and workers themselves have expressed in surveys and whatnot um, increasing interest in becoming union members. So you can see in the slide that um, in the Gallup, which asks this question every year, um, finds that um, approval rates have gone up very dramatically in the last few years. Um, in 2019, 64% of Americans approved of unions, and that's higher than um, all but two years in the last 50. Um, and young people are more likely to have this view. Um, there are these various surveys that try to assess um, to ask workers who are not unionized, would they vote for a union in their workplace if they had the chance? And about half say they would, and that's also higher than in previous surveys. Um, so to sum up, despite its um, sad state in terms of numbers, organized labor and um, the broader labor movement made up of worker centers and other alt labor groups refuses to die. Um, we've seen the dysfunctional like so many other institutions in this country, um, the sort of broken system of the National Labor Relations Act um, system. But nevertheless, efforts to engage in collective action at the workplace continue. Um, and those include not only conventional union campaigns, as I said, but um, various kinds of alt labor activities. And I'll just close by pointing out that organized labor remains the only large scale organized force in this country that actively challenges growing inequality. So um, I'll just have to stop there and my time is up. Thank you so much for listening.